How are you? Happy day. It's good to be with you whatever day it is. It's Monday where I'm at and um, Monday night perhaps where you're watching this or any other time of your life in the world. Um, we are in our final session of the Community Bible Study. Tonight we're going to talk about vocations or um, realms, places where God desires us to serve. And um, he gives us things um, that is his love and his mercy, his grace, forgiveness, eternal life, and he wants us to use those things. And so um, what do we do? This is kind of uh, what does the community of the church look like in the world uh, lesson. So uh, we'll get into that after our, um, our um, whatchamacallit, ah, the, uh, let's see, we will call it, um, it's going to be, uh, that's what I want it to be there. It's going to be our, our hymn to start us off, to give us a little bit of a, a meditative context to start things in. And um, so let's uh, let's see what uh, we have in this one. I am not going to sing this one. I was going to, uh, this is a, a irregular tune, and so so it's there. Um, but, but let me read the words for you as we meditate on, on what this means. How clear is our vocation, Lord, when once we heed your call to live according to your word and daily learn, refresh, restored, that you are Lord of all and will not let us fall. But if forgetful we should find your yoke is hard to bear, if worldly pressures fray the mind and love itself cannot unwind its tangled skein of care, our inward life repair. We marvel how your saints become in hindrances more sure, whose joyful virtues put to shame the casual way we wear your name and by our faults obscure your power to cleanse and cure. In what you give us, Lord, to do, together or alone, in old routines or ventures new, may we not cease to look to you. The cross you hung upon, all you endeavored done. So beautiful words talking about how the Lord gives us a clear calling, um, what is that calling? Let's just be clear. It's to live according to your word. That would be to love God and to love people um, and daily learn, refresh, restore that you are Lord of all and will not let us fall. And so um, when we forget, though, as the second verse says, that our, uh, our, or we find that our yoke is too hard to bear, if worldly pressures fray our minds and love itself cannot unwind, um, we ask God to repair us. Um, so we marvel how your saints become in hindrances more sure. So we go through hard things and we become more confident in God's love. How often do you see that? Uh, that's, a, that's a good study on, on fechtung is the German word for that. Uh, joyful virtues put to shame the casual way we wear your name. And by our faults obscure your power to cleanse and cure. How often do we uh, take things too casually? And uh, that name that means everything for us. Uh, but God gives us uh, things to do together. Here we go, community or alone. Um, and so old routines or ventures new, and never we need to we need to never cease looking to to the source of it all. And, and that cross that flows uh, to us from the cross flows to us life. And all all He endeavored to do is accomplished there for us. So so let's get into our study and um, pray God's blessings upon us, Father in heaven. Thank you for this time in Your Word, and we pray that You would illuminate us uh, once again by the power of Your Holy Spirit in this Pentecost season. We rejoice once again in the gift of knowing that You are a Creator, You are our Sustainer, and Lord, make us holy once again. We pray that You'd bless this this time with Your Your Spirit's guidance and help us to come away with um, the fruit that You would have us. Uh, uh, chew on, but also uh, to lead lives that bear the fruit that you would have us give to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's see if I push this button, it'll go on. All right, so we are not alone. Community Bible study on what the church is all about. If you're not sure, this is where we are. Week six, church, family, and the world. I, I called it here um, realms because those are kind of the realms as we talk about the different places where God's vocations uh, for us work out. We're going to look at, at those, what our Christian vocation is, what our vocation in the home looks like, and then how Jesus sustains us, where we go, um, and, and how, how Jesus guides us. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into all those things together. So here's our uh, question to chew on tonight. Um, uh, are vocations better than vac vacations? <laughs> that was my profound thought for you to chew on. 
Um, so in, in, when, you're, when you are vacating or on vacation, um, you're actually fulfilling vocations ideally as a child of God, um, but potentially if you vocation with your family, vacation with your family, you're vocationing as a, a father or a mother or a child or a sister or a brother. So, so vocations uh, take place on vacations. Oftentimes we think about vocations as our, our daily work or our careers, but um, as Christians we have callings, which is what the word vocation literally means, throughout all the world. So we have many vocations and we're going to scratch the surface of some of them tonight and, and hopefully better grasp where we're, where we're at as the community of believers with our different callings. So, um, and uh, let's see. Um, so Christian vocation, uh, notice how the word calling is used in this passage. So it, uh, just real quick uh, to kind of define that a little bit better. When we hear the word vocation, we do usually think of our jobs in the world, such as uh, counselor, chef, or electrician, right? So that's, what's your vocation? Well, I, I work in the ministry field. I'm a pastor, right? Um, but the functions we perform are only part of our vocation, those specific things that we do. Vocation means calling literally. So vocal cords are used for calling, and so that's where we we see a, a similar root there. So vacation means vocation means calling, and this calling embraces the whole of our lives. In our vocations, we serve others, and ideally, ultimately, the best vocation, the best serving others that we can do, and the best thing we're called to do is to serve others towards a relationship, into relationship uh, with with Jesus, and and um, the Lord func functions uh, greatly in that, and actually works that through us. So. Um, Let's look at these passages here to see this word calling show up. Um, Ephesians 4 verse 1, I therefore, this is Paul, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So Paul's vocation here is vocation of prisoner. How's that for a vocation? Yee. Um, but in, um, so he's urging as a prisoner for the Lord, <laughs> us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called. Let's look at the next one. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 and 14. But we ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So these passages refer to the calling as the, the calling of salvation and, and to be saved, uh, as we, we might say in, in common Christian vernacular. To Have you been saved? Well, yes, I've been called um, by the gospel, right? And so um, this is the, the receiving of God's grace through the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a primary vocation for us as Christians. And so this, this vocation doesn't just stop there. We're not just made Christians and that's just like a portion of our life. It's like the foundation of our life. And then from that, uh, we get like the legs of, or the arms or the barnacles, <laughs> if you will, of the different things that, that we get to do in the world. So as God's child, I get to be a father. As God's child, I get to be a pastor. As God's child, I get to be a, a neighbor in, in my, my neighborhood and in, in, in the world that I'm at. So, so this calling relates to your specific callings in life to serve your neighbor in love as well. When we, when we talk about walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, um, we walk in those different specific vocations, whether it's uh, worker, father, or, or church member. So how, how, what does that worthy manner look like? But that's what we're called to. That's what we're given by Christ. We're given this new life in Christ, which is perfect life. And, and we, we keep receiving that perfect life because we keep, um, what did it say? Um, our, our hearts fray it or our minds fray it, uh, but, but God uh, certainly repairs it for us. So he's called us through the gospel. Um, this calling of eternal life um, isn't just something on hold for us to step into once we uh, go through death, um, but the calling to eternal life begins now, and we get to live that, that life um, here, in, here in, in the temporal time that we are in. Okay? So... <clears throat> Martin Luther says in um, his 31st uh, edition of the um, uh, comments he made, I'm not sure what the title on that one is, AE 31, it refers to the 31st volume of Martin Luther's works um, in the American edition. On page 371, he says, We conclude, therefore, that a Christian lives not in himself, but in Christ and in his neighbor. Otherwise, he is not a Christian. He lives in Christ through faith, and in his neighbor through love. By faith he is caught up beyond himself into God, and by love he descends beneath himself into his neighbor. 
Now, so Luther in this passage, what, what is he saying here? He, his remarks are, are, are pointing us away from our self-made spiritualities that would be self-seeking or self-serving. So um, a, a lot of times we think about our relationship with God as, as something that God does for us, which is certainly good, but it doesn't stop there. And, and it's something that... that God gives to us, but it also drives us into the world around us. Uh, we bear fruit, and, and we don't bear fruit just to sit around us and go rotten or for us to consume more fruit, but we bear fruit for the sake of others. And so by love, we then descend to our neighbors and, and, and ideally are raising them up to this calling as well that, that we have. So lives lived in faith and love uh, uh, look like lives that, that are, are living from the place where God gives his gifts. So, so faithful worship attendance and faithful participation in the church community where the gifts of, God's are, gifts of God are freely given and constantly uh, gathered around and shared together. These gifts of baptism and the word and the Lord's Supper, these gifts are, are the places where Christ comes to us. He, he strengthens our faith. And that, that strengthening of the faith is not just a, a mental thing or even just a heart thing, but it's an action thing as well, because with strengthened faith, we can live strong lives of love for our neighbors. So we, we, uh, we we're faithful in our, our attendance and, and participation in the life of the church. We're faithful in our scriptural studies, um, even in the midst of our vocations. And, and in our homes, we, we lead others to those good things. That's what Christian vocation looks like. It's, it's receiving from God and leading others to receive from God. And then even in the workplace, being people who are faithful, hard workers, doing our best performance that we can at the tasks that we're given to do, giving glory to God and the gifts that he's given us to share with the world around us. So, so vocation is a very, very fun thing to talk about. It's a very uh, foundational thing for us to, to live from because it's, it's a great place for us to see um, God doesn't just save us for Sunday mornings. He doesn't just save us for eternal life. He saves us for the sake of our neighbors uh, that they might be saved, ideally. All right. So let's look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 through 45. We're going to see where Jesus puts himself here. All right. So uh, God, uh, last week we talked about the royal priesthood. So we are all priests, and that means we're people who stand between God and the world. We, we, we turn towards God in prayer on behalf of the world, but also we turn toward the world in, in serving the gifts that God has given us and in serving in the different things that we have. That was the role of the priest, to be that intermediary, to be that in-between, and, that, and that's, that's what a priest is. So as priests, we, we, we work not just within the church. Again, we're not just Sunday morning people, but we're week-long people. We're uh, everyday people of God. And so, so God has placed us in lots of different places and vocations in the world. Um, so, and, and, and in that, we're going to see uh, where Jesus shows up for us. <clears throat> All right. So Matthew chapter 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. So this is, this is the king. This is the judge. This is Christ on his throne. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? I pushed the wrong button. Um, and, and when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So, so notice where Jesus puts himself in this, this picture of the, the judgment that's to come for all of us. Notice where Jesus puts himself. And, and, and this is incredibly inspirational. Um, that's what the Holy Spirit does. He inspires us. Um, so this is incredibly uh, inspiriting. This is incredibly enlivening to see where Jesus is in our lives. Um, of note, first importance, Jesus doesn't need our service because, you know, Almighty God doesn't need anything from anyone. He, he desires to give and to be for the world. So, so the Lord doesn't need our service, but our Lord directs us to the people who need our service because of Christian love. 
Luther's vibrant understanding that we had of, of vocation, just a glimpse of, of his, his teaching on vocation, it's the context of life for the royal priesthood, and it, and it shows up in the small catechism even more in the table of duties, in that place where he describes the, the sacrifices of believers without even once mentioning that word priest, but it's the work of the priesthood of believers. Yet these are sacrifices we make as God's priests in this world, in the duties that we do. So the, the table of duties is, is sometimes that forgotten, it almost seems like an appendix part of the small catechism, not the small catechism with explanation, the small catechism has a table of duties on it and in it all sorts of vocations are listed there and, and Luther uh, compiles there quickly a list of different things and vocations, places that we're called to serve. So we, we, we do these things um, towards the Lord is what we're learning. What Jesus says here is that when we do these things, we're doing them for the Lord, as to the Lord. And, and what a joyous realization that when we're serving our neighbors, we're actually serving our Lord because the, our Lord has put himself in the place where those need to receive our service are at. So I, I don't know if that makes sense, but this is just a beautiful picture of, of the way we serve in the world. And we're actually serving God. This is how we love God by loving our neighbor. We're loving his creation and, and taking care of his creatures. Um, that's, that's what we're called to do in the various callings that we have is, is to be the people of love. And, um, and, 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 and I just love these people. So this, this slide right here has, has the wicked on it who are like, well, we, we did all sorts of, um, um, they, they imply with their answer, we, we did all sorts of uh, hungry feeding and thirsty drinking and, and stranger uh, meeting and naked clothing and sick helping and, and in prison visiting. And, and we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't not do it when we saw you because we never saw you. Uh, um, and then um, the other people, though, are, are saying, um, we, we, didn't, we didn't do that for you. We... we so there, there's not um, there's not a negative here that there shows up in the sex one in this next one. All right. So, anyways, um, that's just a, a helpful contextualization for that passage. This this one has a negative here. And when did we not do that for you? And these people said we we didn't ever see you. Uh, um, we we didn't know it was you. They didn't say we did not not do it for you. So it's it's kind of a nuanced thing, but it, it's it's a powerful nuance when you catch it. These people are like, well, we we didn't do it for you. Um, we just did those things. And the other people are like, but we never saw you. We would have done it if we knew it was you. Is is kind of the implication that you get from that. So we as God's baptized people have all sorts of various callings, varied callings, but we have some common vocations as baptized people. There are things that we are called to do. So individual Christians are called to specific vocations, and, and the church is called to a common mission of, of teaching and missions. So those are the two common vocations that we have as Christians, uh, making disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, um, that's the missions, and, and teaching them so it, to obey everything that I've commanded you. Those things that God has given us to do, those are our common callings as Christians. We share those together. So as the royal priesthood, we engage in these works of, of edification, of teaching, and of mission. This is what we do, and, and, and we cannot do otherwise. It, that, that's a really cool understanding to have. Um, because because sometimes we start to scratch our heads and say, am I, um, or how how can I better teach or how can I better be missions? And and it's just to better know your Savior's love for you. And that's really what the Savior's love works in you. All right. So so hearing that your sins are forgiven, your life is restored, eternal life is given to you now, gives you a joy and a gladness that just flows from you to be a, a, a missional person, to de be a, a teaching person, to share this gift that God has given to you. So so if you're, you're like, I don't know if I'm doing a great job of teaching, confess your sins, repent and, and, and be, believe that that Christ does these things for you and and through you and and they'll they'll happen because that's what God does. Now that doesn't mean we just close our eyes and say I believe God's going to work through me. No, we we open our eyes and say I believe in God and and look at this creation God has given me, places he's put me and and people he's given me to interact with, which is a royal uh, a really cool thing for us to notice. So he leads us from the gifts that he gives into the world to give more gifts to the people around us. So everything uh, that we do in the church as, as the body of believer, believers is, is ordered towards this goal that we receive from God in the church nothing but the forgiveness of sins and the words and the sacraments that he's given us. There's nothing but the uninterrupted 
forgiveness of sins. This, this is from Luther's Large Catechism. He says, um, everything in the church is ordered towards the daily reception in the church of nothing but the forgiveness of sins, nothing but continuous, uninterrupted forgiveness of sins. This is because God forgives us, and because we forgive, bear with and help one another. And, and because God forgives us, we forgive, bear with and help one another. It flows through us to the people around us. It, it, it you're like, well, I don't know if it's flowing through me. Stop! Don't let, don't stop stopping it. Don't, don't let it not flow through you because that's what it naturally does. This love that God has for you is a love that flows through you. And, 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 and again, I keep coming back to the boat because, because I think we do this. We object and our sinful condition is rearing its ugly head and saying, but I could do better or I haven't done it enough or that sounds like a lot of work. It's not a lot of work. It's just rejoicing in the gift that you're given and sharing that gift with the people around you. And, and so if you don't feel like that gift's being shared with the people around you, Share it, all right? It's cool. Yeah, so um, let's see. Um, so we are um, common vocation sharers. We, we, we share in, in giving the gifts of God um, and, and talking about the gifts of God, uh, learning and, and sharing it with the people who don't know. And the way we, we get better at that is by just reveling in it and and what you're doing right now better understanding it 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 makes you want to tell people hey this world sucks but we got a better answer we got jesus who's redeemed the whole world and promises us a new creation we want to be a part of that i'm a part of that you want to be a part of that that's that's what our our missions are and and what our teaching is all about all right so let's go on here matthew chapter 15 Five, that's five. That's the number five right there. First um, Peter two and First Peter three. So evangelism and missions are said to be the highest expression of priestly love for the neighbor. I don't know who says that, but apparently it's something that's said, uh, according to Dr. Masaki. It's said to be the highest expression. Evangelism and missions is said to be the highest expression of priestly love for the neighbor. However, all of our callings evan are. Of all our callings, evangelism in our daily life in the world may be the most challenging work. So Matthew 5, 1 Peter 2 and 3 are going to help us with this. What do we learn about evangelism in our daily lives? Let's see. All right. Matthew 5. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven, your Father who is in heaven. I love it. So they see your good works and they're not like, hey, Good job, Pastor. Well, people people do say that sometimes, and and I try to uh, piously say, "Praise the Lord," because we want to give glory to God. Um, but 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 I, I just love what Jesus says in this passage. They see your good works, and they're like, "God's awesome," which is a great way to to understand how uh, God works through people in this world. All right, First Peter three. Um, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, be subject to your own husbands, not subjects of your husbands, but subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. All right, so, no, so notice here, um, so this is a picture of a wife with a husband who might not be a believer. Uh, so wives, um, be subject to them that basically um, be a helper to them as God created Eve to be a helper to Adam. And that's, that's not a submissive in the negative sense of the term that we think of it, but it's, it's what we're called to do is to, to work together in the places God has given us. So that even if some, that some husbands do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their, their wives. So, so ideally, Holy Spirit work through people and work through the words and work in our lives so that when people see us loving, even when, when people don't know the Lord, they might be like, hey, why are they like this? And, and we can be like, well, give glory to our Father who's in heaven. All right, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Um, and, and I think this is a great picture. I, I love that passage for, for missions and, and being prepared to give a defense or say, hey, this is why I'm loving you. This is why I'm being nice to you. It's not because I'm great. It's because God is great. All right, First Peter 2, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So God's uh, royal priests, that is you, go about your daily affairs and business. You do your work as a wife or a mother, as a husband or a father, as sons or daughters, employers or employees, and so on through the list of things. In these various stations God has put you, 
inside and outside the home, you're called to lead a good life now and to do good works. Now, here's, here's a little Greek for you. The word good that shows up here is actually from the Greek word kalos, which is um, better translated or, or perhaps more uh, vibrantly translated if we uh, translate it with the word beautiful. So uh, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your beautiful works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Um, and in... Uh, um, Let's see, over here in, in, in verse uh, 2, in chapter 2, keep your conduct honorable, um, so beautiful, um, so that they may see your beautiful deeds and glorify God on the day of the visitation. So these, these beautiful things that we do draw attention not to us, but to God. And, and yeah, so initially they'll draw attention to us, but we can point people to the source of the beauty that, that flows from us. So by these good works, believers and unbelievers to the faith that they hold, uh, believers attract unbelievers to the faith that we hold and, and, and confess and, and of which we speak whenever opportunities arise. So, so only, only good tre- trees bear good fruit, scripture tells us, and, and a branch bears fruit only when it's connected to the tree. So going back to the source is, is what we continually need to do so we can draw um, and, and receive from the Lord so we can give to the world. This is the, the vitality that we have. This is the Lord's flow through us um, in our daily living. This, the love to God and service, love from God and service to our neighbor. And, and um, Pastor Love uh, always, not always, I guess that would be kind of boring, um, but uh, regularly uses the illustration of a pipe and a bucket. I think a lot of times we think as our life as Christians, as we need to just receive the forgiveness of sins and we'll just keep it in a bucket. And, and that's no good that if you picture the, the Jesus Christ is, is the living water that flows to us, we don't want to let it just sit there and be stagnant. But no, if we see ourselves as a pipe and, and God's put us in different places, we actually get to direct the, the mercies and love of God that flow through us to the world around us. And, and what a great reality to, to live in that God has given us. So families is one of the best, best vocation places that we see our calling to, to do the things of God. So, so uh, marriage and, and parenting, these are, are great places to see this because um, a lot of the things we do in life, even if it's uh, selling a car to somebody or, or fixing a car or why am I in a, in a car dealership right now in my head, um, but whenever, whatever our vocations might be, whether it's delivering mail or or um, painting a picture. Um, we're, we're doing parental and familial things on some levels by taking care of and providing for others through the things that we have that they need. So, so family is a great microcosm to see the great works of the world. So looking at these passages, look how a Christian husband and a Christian wife live from the Lord's gifts, all right? So Christian husband, Christian wife, they live from the Lord's gifts. And, and notice as we read these passages how a Christian's life in, in marriage or in family might look different from, from a, a life that's not flowing from that. So notice the emphasis and what we learn about evangelism in our everyday life from these passages. Ephesians uh, 5 verse 21 through 33, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. I love that um, Dr. Masaki started this uh, passage with this verse because that's, that's what I do when I'm, I'm teaching my, um, when I do premarital counseling because this passage, um, a lot of times we, we pick up here in Ephesians 5, verse 22, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And the wife is, is all automatically on guard. And not automatically, but because of our, our contexts that we live in and the conditioning of the world, this idea of submission just doesn't sound good. But, but verse 21 tells everybody, submit to everybody out of reverence for Christ. Now, specifically, wives, submit to your husbands. Um, but, but backing up to verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Husbands are also to sp- submit to their wives. Here's, here's a, a great illustration for what submission means, and I, and I like this picture. Um, if you've ever filled out a form on the internet, you, you type in all your information and say you want to you wanna buy a car, right? or, or whatever you fill out a form for. You want to um, pay your taxes or... Um, what, online form. You're filling it out. You're, and then at the bottom, there's a button you have to click in order to send off your information. And that, that button says sometimes says submit. And what you're doing is you're submitting your information. And, and the reason you're submitting your information is because you want to be a part of something. Yeah, you wouldn't give the information or, or you need to be a part of something. Maybe it's like a, a mandated form from the government or something that you're filling out online. But when you click that submit button, you're deciding to be a part of something. And so when we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, we're, we're giving ourselves to others because we want to be a part 
part of these other people. And 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 here's here's to complete the picture. If you're um, if you're filling out that form online and then you see that button submit, and you're like, ooh, submission. That doesn't sound very um, good for me. It sounds like I'm weak if I have to submit. It's like no. If, if you don't submit, you, you just don't get to be a part. You don't get to gain the, 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 the realities of, of what this uh, form is allowing you to be a part of it. And so, too, in our relationships with each other. A wife that doesn't submit to her husband or, or a, a Christian that doesn't submit to someone else is not allowing that relationship to be God-pleasing and what God intends it to be. So, all right, so wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. <clears throat> On the cross, dead, remember? Uh, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. So we, we want to live in this, um, this place. Um, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So we, we, we treat each other with gentleness and respect. That's, again, not just a one-way street where women have to respect their husbands, but it's our Christian calling. And, and I think the Lord puts those, those words there. I think the Lord puts the words in scriptures because wives might be inclined to not submit to their husbands. They might be inclined to be like, I got this. And um, that, that guy over there, not very respectable. Right? I, don't, I don't respect him. Um, may it not be, but I, I think the Lord puts these words, and if they're convicting for us, if they're hard for us to hear, we should meditate on them and say, well, what do they mean for me, and why am I having a hard time hearing this? Am I understanding it correctly? And um, more can be said about that. But, but notice, um, in this relationship, we, we mirror a sacrificial giving um, of ourselves, um, both wives to their husbands, but of, of the husband for the wife. So the husband's called to give up his life, as, as Christ gave up his life for the church. And, and a beautiful thing that we kind of step back and see that marriage is just a picture of God working with his creation. Because God's creation was the church before the fall into sin. And that was the way he provided. And, and in marriage, we, we are um, a picture of, of Christ and his church. Um, a lot of times we say, well, Christ and his church is a picture of marriage. No, no, marriage is just a picture of, it's a reflection of God and his love for the world. Because um, ideally, the whole world would be a part of God's church. Um, so, something for you to think about there. All right, um, so the, uh, I, I missed some words here. Notice the emphasis and what we learn about evangelism. I, I keep putting that at the top of the slides. It's the third slide it showed up on. So sorry. Um, so more, two more passages about family um, here. So Genesis 1, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And that's the first vocation. It's pretty cool. Just take care of the earth. That, that dominion word, again, has been corrupted by so many domineering things in this world. Uh, but, but literally, we are to take care of the world. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Again, take care of it. Go around the world and enjoy it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. <gasps> yeah, we get to do that. That, that's, that's what we, we are, are, are fitted together to be in marriage is, is fillers of the world and enjoyers and, and domineerers of creation in the best sense of the terminology. And so in the image of God, um, we are created. And, and what is God? God has dominion over the world and he tells us have dominion over the world. That is to take care of it, to provide for it. We just get this sinful connotations with so many of the good words that God gives to us, like submission. It's like, oh, that's a bad thing. We don't want to do that. No, it's just giving ourselves for the sake of another. This is this is what God does for us. He submits himself to the, the pain and suffering and death on the cross so that we might have life forever. Submission is, is the most loving thing you could do. And, and, and then this domineering word that to have dominion over the earth, we're like, well, we, we're not supposed to have control over it. What's wrong with control? It's taking care of it. It's being a, 
a steward of God's good creation. And, and um, I think Satan just loves to twist our understandings of these great words that God gives us. So don't let him do it. Own these words and lean into them and say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a caretaker for God's creation. All right, and then God gave um, uh, Adam a helper because he said it's not good that man should be alone, and it's not good. Uh, we, we should be in life together, whether it's with a spouse or whether it's just with our friends that we have. We are called to be in community, hence the title of the Bible study. So um, Genesis 2, verse 23, Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. In the Bible, it's usually printed indentedly as if it's a poem, which I think is pretty cool because Adam's like, hey, my wife is here. I'm gonna, this woman is my wife, this, this woman. And he breaks into song and he just starts singing. So, uh, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, Isha, because she was taken out of man, Ish. So man is Ish in Hebrew and woman is Isha, as if Adam was like, I think she's like a Ish, but ah, she's so pretty. Ah, Isha. All right. So anyways, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, two shall become one flesh. They're fitted together. And um, the one thing that I, I, I think is powerful to understand in vocation uh, in marriage is is that you as an individual have a calling, but when you're spoused up with somebody that is married, another way to say married, I think, just made that word terminology up, um, but when you're married to someone, you are no longer just yourself. Um, you might go to your own job, but your, your uh, spouse is also going to their job, and you, you know, you're vocating in different places. But you're, you're, you have a new calling as a husband and wife to be a, a one flesh union to love the world. And so you nurture each other and each other's weaknesses are your weaknesses, your strengths are your strengths. And, and you become this bigger, better vocator of the world because God has a calling for the two of you in various places. And um, that, that illustration of, of um, two oxen pulling a, a cart um, doesn't just do double the work or have double the capacity of one ox in pulling a cart, but it's actually a multiplier when they're working side by side. And um, I'm not an oxen farmer or a farmer that uses oxen, I think would be a, a more um, agriculturally accurate way of saying it. Um, but, but I hear it's true. So, all right, so marriage is a great thing for us to, to lean into and um, uh, specifically then with children. So what's the best thing parents can do for their children? Uh, but Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. This is the best thing Christian parents can do for their children. It's to, to bring them to church with them, to bring them to Jesus through, through Bible stories and prayers at tables and bedtime and, and in between those times where, okay, you might do the obligatory uh, Bedtime prayers and the obligatory uh, dinner prayers, but in between prayers and, and teaching the scriptures and, and studying the small catechism, this this is what a Christian home looks like. Hymns to to sing, not just in church, but also in the home, and, and to come, of course, to church where where uh, Sunday school takes place, and, and you're there together. Parents go to Bible study, and the kids go to Sunday school, and then you talk about the Word in the week throughout the the week that you have together. It's not just a Sunday morning obligation that we have, but we have this this gift of of community within the home where we can be about these gifts of God and continue to to rejoice in this um, kingdom that we are a part of. So, so that's there. I, I have a book recommendation. I know some of you appreciate those. This, this is one of my favorite books on vocation. It's called Family Vocation by Jean Edward Veith and Mary J. Morby. And um, I think that's how you say her name. We'll just go with it. Um, but this is God's calling in marriage, parenting, and childhood. So um, if you are in a family, or if you know a family, um, this is a great book to check out on um, how these vocations show up in our life. I need to read it again. It's been a few years since I went through it, and it's, it's very helpful. All right. <clears throat> Last section here, Jesus prays for his church. Jesus' preservation of his church is no smaller miracle than his founding of it. So the fact that the church exists is pretty miraculous. I think we talked about that in, in the Miracles Bible study that we did. Um, just as the preservation of the world is, is no smaller miracle than his creation of the world, the fact that the world still exists is almost as, if not more, incredible than the fact that God spoke it into existence. I mean, you think with all the evil that is in the world, it would have destroyed itself, but God curbs evil. It's kind of cool how God works to keep his world going. Um, so, so too, the church cannot be destroyed. He keeps it going. Um, and, and one of the biggest reasons is um, because God wants it to, but <laughs> another big reason is Jesus prays for his church because he wants it to keep going. So how does Jesus pray for his church? 
in John 17, you get a big prayer, but here's a couple portions for you. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. I love this. This kind of ties a couple of things we've talked about. So, so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Um, so, so God is glorified in your works. And um, those, um, and it sounds right here, uh, uh, I'm not praying for the world. It might sound like Jesus is kind of heartless. I'm not praying for the world. I don't care about the world. He doesn't say he's not caring about the world. You know what I mean? But it sounds like that he's, that he's kind of going that way. But he says, I'm not praying for the world. And then later on, he says, I'm not asking for these only, actually, but also for those who will believe in me through their name, through their word. And so the, the word that we speak, ideally, and, and Holy Spirit grantingly, is bringing people to believe and be a part of this family that God calls us to. All right, so so Jesus praying for his church, though, um, doesn't um, just um, say, hey, he's praying for us, but it's also an example for us of, of what we should do. So what does Jesus' prayer teach us about the meaning of prayer in our lives? And, and so Paul prays this. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, so that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And that's Paul's prayer for us. So um, there's, there's nothing that, that binds parents and children more deeply than the prayers that we make for them. And so parents um, um, and, and, and all the people in your life, if, and uh, I love uh, another book recommendation. I don't have a, a screen for this, but Life Together. Gosh, that would have been a good book to, uh, to skim through as we're going through the study. Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, talks about how we are called to, uh, to pray together and um, uh, to pray for our enemies. And it, he just does a great job of, of showing how we're to love our enemies and do good to those who hurt you as Jesus calls us to. And, and that begins with prayer. So there's, there's nothing better we can do than prayer. Um, think about how, how far less anxiety we would have about our children if we just laid our burdens before the Lord. Um, and, and think about how much stronger um, the relationship between a husband and wife would be um, so that we, we pray for each other. Um, that it just puts you in each other's lives. So there's, there's nothing in the church as well that, that binds each other better than, than praying for each other. So, so here's, here's kind of the culminating capstone of this community that we're a part of. Yeah, we, we pray, God, grow your church. But I think a, a prayer we can pray along with that is, God, God strengthen the bonds within your church. And I, I hope we can do that, but I don't think we can. Um, you listening? Uh, I, I think God will do that, though. And, and I think praying for it is a great way for us to step into what God has planned for us as, as he's um, given us. So, um, so there's, a, there's a scene in uh, Bo Geertz's novel, The Hammer of God, where a dying old father responds to his daughter when she urged him to think about Jesus. And, and he says, I'm not able to, Lena. I can't think any longer. But I know that Jesus is thinking of me. What What? What a beautiful picture when, when, we are, um, when we're struggling to wonder if we are capable of doing things to know the one who is able, all right? And this is the reason we bow our knees before him. So what holds sure and certain is not what we do to God or to each other. The most certain ground of our confidence is that we belong to him. Rejoice, you belong to God. So the Lord gave you an eternal home and an everlasting destiny through baptism. He gives you an abundant life in his church by continuing to serve you with the forgiveness of sins won by Christ on the cross and delivered in preaching in the Lord's Supper. So Jesus is continually thinking of us, continually praying for us, and he prays for us, and, and because of that, his community, the church, will go on forever. So we've made it through the community Bible study. Here's some homework for you. Uh, meditate on the table of duties from Luther's small catechism. Dust off your catechism. Go to that part that you always forget about at the end. 
after the six chief parts, after the daily prayer section, uh, look at the table of duties, uh, reflect on the scripture passages that relate to your stations of life. And then think about how you want to contribute to the Christian vocations of teaching and missions. And, and you're already contributing in some way by being a part of this, but, but share maybe something you learned with somebody else or, or encourage others to be a part of, of the teaching. And then be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have within you, a reason for the hope that you have within you. And then receive. Go to the places where God gives his grace to you. Go to church. And uh, thanks be to God, we, we have that opportunity, that option in the, the the um, delivery system of God's gifts is in effect for us, and it is powerful and effective. Let's not the world. Let's not let the world drown it out, or or Satan in his his doubts he plants in our lives, and the the thorns he sticks in our path uh, derail the work that God continues to do. All right. Oh, really. well, thanks for thanks for being a part of this with me. Um, if you got any questions about this or anything. You know where to get a hold of me. And I, I just pray God's blessings upon you. And we'll go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Uh, may it be and abide with us always. Amen. We'll see you later.